everybody, Sarah here. I'm finally back after a long hiatus. I am now married. I would show you my ring, but it is in for being soldered, and so it's not going to be back for a couple more weeks. Uh, but I, everything, all of these videos for the last like month and a half have all been pre-recorded, but I'm now making new videos for you guys, finally. I know that you guys probably didn't see much of a break. I've still been posting them up uh, every single week on Fridays, but um, I am now finally recording as a married woman for the first time. Uh, my husband already came in once and interrupted my recording, so this is just my life now and that's fine. Um, this video is going to be a super exciting and super interesting one and when someone asked me the question about this, I was at first like, I don't know why, I don't know, I'm not going to do a video on this, but then once I started digging into it, it just like, it just fired up my brain and I love it so much. Uh, before I jump into it though, I do want to ask that you guys subscribe. Uh, I... I think that only like 50%, maybe less of the people who watch my videos are subscribed. So if you like corn snakes and you want to see corn snake content that's educational, that's what I'm here for. So please subscribe for that. Uh, it definitely helps me and definitely doesn't hurt you. So um, and you're only going to see a video from me once a week. I'm not going to be spamming. So just letting you know. Uh, I will be posting um, another wedding video that's more like refined and fine-tuned uh, sometime, but uh, that'll not be in this playlist or anything like that. I'm gonna kind of put it over on the side in its own playlist. Uh, and the other announcement that I have is that I have somewhat sort of new merch uh, going on. And uh, right now, between now and the end of the year, I'm going to be giving you guys 30% off with the code TD30. And the reason that it's TD30 is that stands for tie dye. And um, I am now offering tie dyed shirts with my snake shop logo snake on it. So it's this snake right here. Um, I'll also put a picture over here probably. Uh, you can get it tie-dyed in any color you like. Just order your size that you want and shoot me an email and let me know what colors you want it to be. And if you want me to sign it, I will also do that for free. These are all pre-shrunk and pre-washed, so you do not have to worry about them shrinking on you. We have everything from size small to like 3XL. So uh, if you are looking to get a really cool tie-dye shirt, maybe for someone for Christmas, now is the time because uh, all of those shirts are going to be 30% off, plus any of the other merch on my website as well. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the actual palmetto portion of this video. I'm sorry if my lighting is weird. Um, I have a kind of a loose cord that I have to like jiggle once in a while or the light turns off. Um, but I'm just going to move on from that. So first of all, I'm going to start out with the history of palmetto. You can find a lot of this specific information in my first book. Uh, that's the Corn Snake Cultivar Compilation Volume 1. There's also a second volume as well. Uh, the first one goes over all of the actual uh, mu gene mutations that we know of, and the second one goes over all of the selectively bred types. So palmetto is one of the newer mutations that has been found. The original one, the original one was wild caught in South Carolina in 2008, and then in 2011 it was proven to at least be inheritable by Don Soderbergh. Uh, since he proved it to be inheritable, he called it the Palmetto Corn Snake, and that's how it got its name. He named it after the state that it was found in, South Carolina, uh, which is known as the Palmetto State, and that's why it has its name. Um, it was proven later on to be incomplete dominant instead of recessive, like we originally thought uh, after just some other breeding trials. A lot of breeders noticed that the hep palmettos all had a certain sort of hypomelanistic look to them, which basically means they were a little bit lighter colored than your average normal and obviously darker than the palmetto. And that's why it is deemed to be incomplete dominant. Uh, incomplete dominant essentially means just that. It is when the um, actual, the full gene mutation is bred to a normal and you get this sort of in-between look instead of it looking completely like a normal. Uh, or completely the other direction. So um, a dominant, a full-on dominant mutation, something like tessera, if you breed a uh, tessera, a, like full tessera, which would be a homozygous tessera to a normal, all the babies are gonna be tessera. If you breed a palmetto to a normal, all of the babies are going to look sort of like an in-between look, which is sort of your hypomelanistic look. Uh, it's similar to cinder. I did a video on that not that long ago, and I'll link that up above for you guys to go watch if you wanna see it. Uh, so. 
that is sort of the overview of palmetto as we know it now uh, but what's interesting about palmetto is that many of them have this what is known in the hobby commonly as bug eyedness uh, or just having a bug eye or big eyes uh, the reason they call them bug eyes as you know is bugs tend to have like really large like looking eyes even though it's multiple different eyes all in the same area um, it's just that sort of big bulginess that brings out the bug eyed um, name. The scientific name for this enlargement of the eyes is uh, macrothalmia. Just in case anyone is wondering, there is going to be some scientific terms in here, but um, and it's going to get a little bit complicated, but I'm going to put it in layman's terms the best I can. I did a lot of researching in genetics when I was when I was younger and when I was in college and even now like I do a lot of research with genetics so I understand a lot of the concepts and can kind of present it to you guys in a way that's a lot easier to understand than all of these like super complicated papers and stuff that are out there. So before I jump into the eyes being bigger or smaller, I want to talk about the gene that is responsible for palmetto, the gene mutation. And I want to point out that I'm hoping I don't slip up in, in all of this because sometimes I tend to say gene when I mean gene mutation. Uh, but in this specific video, it's very important that you understand that when a gene is mutated, it creates the mutation, the, the different look. It's not always a different look. Um, it can cause a lot of different things. But um, what we're talking about when we're talking about like palmetto or, or whether we're talking about motley or amel or any of that, those are gene mutations. Uh, those are not just genes by themselves. A gene had to be mutated for those to be created and look that way. Uh, so palmetto is a gene mutation. And the gene that gets mutated to create palmetto, which uh, as many of you may know is a leucistic gene, um, is the MITF gene. So uh, I understand you may not know the, what the MITF gene is. That's okay. I'm going to kind of go over it. Uh, but basically the MITF gene is involved in putting cells where they're supposed to go. MITF is short for melanocyte inducing transcription factor. So uh, for those of you who don't really know, melanocytes are, they're basically cells uh, and the transcription is basically like telling where the cells should go. So uh, melanocyte inducing is like um, cell inducing or, or cell almost creating. I don't want to say creating, but uh, that's sort of the concept. Um, transcription factor meaning like telling it where to go. So uh, it kind of uh, creates these cells and tells them where to go essentially. That's not exactly it, but uh, just to kind of give you an idea. Now there's obviously different types of cells that um, like melanocytes are produced in like different genes are also responsible for some melanocytes. But this, uh, this type of cell, it's a melanocyte. A melanocyte is a type of cell. There are many, many different types of cells. Uh, melanocyte is a type of cell. Uh, this gene is, is specifically involved with melanocytes. And melanocytes um, often are pigment cells, but they can also be other kinds of cells. And this gene tells those cells where to go and how many of them there should be in that spot. And when it is mutated, it prevents those cells from going to where they should go or too many of them go where they shouldn't be. So, um, and it's more, it is more often the case that fewer cells end up going where they should than too many cells, but we'll get to that and you might see where it's going here. So this and this gene mutation is responsible for palmetto in that it prevents the pigments from going where they should go. And pigment just doesn't happen in a lot of places on a palmetto. And this is what causes it. Now, the uh, website that I'm using to actually look at this is a website called uh, Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution. And this was uh, actually published in February of 2021, so not that long ago. So this is pretty new information, uh, but they actually did this on the leucistic Texas rat snake. Uh, now, if you don't know, leucistic Texas rat snakes also have this bug eyedness thing going on. So um, it, and it, is, it is most likely the same gene that is being mutated for the Texas leucistic rat and corn snakes leucism uh, palmetto. So that being said, since they're the same gene, most likely, now obviously they haven't done 
this um, exactly for corn snakes. They have done it for these rat snakes. They haven't exactly done it for corn snakes, but since they're so closely related and the genes do pretty much exactly the same, or these mutations do pretty much exactly the same thing, and they also include this like eye problem, uh, we can pretty much assume that it is the same MITF gene that is being mutated and causing this. So um, the this also for just f sort of as a an aside, but also keep in the back of your mind, um, thinking that it was interesting. This is also the same gene that is responsible for piebaldism in a lot of animals. Uh, it's the same gene that is responsible for most likely the pied gene in corn snakes as well. Um, now, just because it's potentially or most likely the same gene that is being mutated that does not mean that if you breed the two of them together you're going to get something new or special so just because you have a palmetto and a pied blood red breeding them together may not do anything different uh genes are very very big <laughs> even though they're very very small they're very very big in that there's a lot of different places on a like gene strand that can be mutated so just because something up here is mutated to create pied and something way down here is mutated to create palmetto that doesn't mean if you breed a pied and a palmetto together that you're gonna mix something together that's not really how it works they're pretty um supposedly we don't know but uh they are most likely relatively far apart from each other farther apart from each other than you know than you then you might actually get like any kind of mix going on with it. So I'm just sort of mentioning that. Uh, but it is highly likely that piebaldism and the pied in corn snakes is also um, produced by this gene. And that's why you just get these white patches with corn snakes and, uh, or I'm sorry, with um, pie, with pied corn snakes. And you also get obviously white with your palmettos as well. So this MITF gene controls where the pigment does and does not go when the pigment is turned off and on and not just pigment but other types of cells and um, it does not say in this specific article that I'm looking at and I'll link it down below I'm going to link everything that I use to research down below so that you guys can also go research it if you want uh, the frontiers in ecology is going to be the, the very first one that I put in there but the next one that I'm going to put in there is actually the information that I found on the MITF gene and what it actually controls and what it changes. So um, I don't wanna say what it changes, but what it, what it actually controls. And one of the main things that it controls is the size of the eye. Shocker, right? Um, so it not only controls the pigment, but it controls how many cells are put into the eye. Now I'm going to link everything down below that I use to research this. It does get kind of complex, but one of the other places that I found to be really, really helpful was um, amigogenealogy.org. So it's amigo.genealogy.org. Uh, in there, you can find so many different things. But when you look up uh, MITF, actually you, ha you have to type out the melanocyte inducing transcription factor. Uh, and I, like I said, I'm going to link that that search down below so you guys don't have to go type it in uh it lists like a whole list of what exactly this will do and uh if you click on some of these and you kind of dig a little bit deeper uh like i said it does control the size of the eyes now most of the time it will make the eyes smaller not bigger but uh, in the case of rat snakes leucistic texas rat snakes and corn snakes um it seems that this gene, uh, like where it's mutated to create the leucism look is very, very close on the, on the gene itself to the spot that controls how many cells go to the eyes. And so it is because of this mutation very, very close to the eye size section of the gene that um, sometimes that eye size section also gets mutated and it can get mutated in different ways. It doesn't just get mutated to go one way or the other. Uh, we have not seen necessarily palmettos that have smaller eyes than usual, 
But what we have seen when this gene is mutated for pied is actually a line of pied that have no eyes at all. And this was actually um, told to me by Don Soderberg, not the whole thing, but uh, a few years ago I hatched out an eyeless corn snake and um, he ended up being euthanized because he wasn't that healthy and I didn't know how his life was going to be or how uh, any of the mutations might have uh, affected him. But he, Don Soderberg, had through his pied blood red line created uh, on accident, not on purpose, but had hatched out some eyeless corn snakes and found out that that was also inheritable in his pied line. So it is highly possible that line breeding pieds uh, created a mutation in this eye size as well. And it could have just, um, like I said, since this gene not only controls like where different color turns off and on or where it goes and doesn't go, uh, it can also just decide to not form cells in the eye as well. Now, Don did say to me in our conversation about the um, eye list that he has from his pied blood red line was that there were some eyeballs like in the sockets. They just were not fully formed. So the MITF gene just simply when it was mutated it just turned off the cell production into the eye too early and the eyes just did not didn't fully form they were there they just didn't fully form and that's the kind of thing that we normally expect to see when the MITF gene mutates and it affects the eyes uh, most places that I did see uh, MITF um, functioning being mutated at least in humans and uh, in other things and other places the eyes just didn't form enough or they didn't form at all um, or they didn't form enough at least for the for the animal or person to see. Uh, now, that usually meant maybe that the eyes were too small or parts of the eye were too small. But in the case of these rat snakes and the corn snakes, the eyes just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger until like the snake hatches, apparently. Uh, and that's not exactly how it works, but um, the, the gene does not turn off the cells that are going to the eye soon enough. Now, the biggest question is uh, what do we do about it and can we predict it? And I would say as far as my research goes right now, we really can't predict when it happens. We we can't just be like, oh, if I breed, you know, this to this, then I have a 50% chance of getting this. Like we do in, you know, if we breed an AML to a HET AML, we know we have 50% chance of getting AMLs. Uh, it doesn't really work like that uh, because the mutation that creates the leucism happens like so close to the area that affects the size of the eye, we uh, cannot say either way when we are going to get a palmetto or a leucistic Texas rat that has larger eyes. We, we just, we don't know. We can't say that. Uh, we do have some somewhat anecdotal evidence uh, here and there from breeders that uh, ones that do have these mutated eyeballs are more likely to have offspring that have mutated eyeballs, uh, but ones that do not have mutated eyeballs can still create ones that do have uh, mutated eyeballs. So it's, it's genuinely hard to know, and it doesn't seem like the eyeball mutation is as linked, obviously, with the pied, because we, we do not see very many eyeless pieds around. We, you know, we've only, I've really only heard of it this one time. And it could be that it's completely unrelated. There are a lot of different genes that affect the eye size and the eye shape and the eye color and all of that. Eyes are relatively complicated. And so there's a lot of different genes that go into uh, making them what they are. So it could be that in Don's case with his eyeless pieds, that they, that's a completely different thing. You know, gene mutations happen and they happen at random. And that's why we have all these different gene mutations. AML happened at random. Sunkissed happened at random. You know, all of these genes that we have, these gene mutations, sorry, I slipped up. All of these gene mutations that we have, they all just happened at random. So it could be that Don's eyeless just happened at random. It has nothing to do with the fact that Pied is in there as well. Uh, but it is interesting to me that one of the few other times that we have seen an actual gene mutation that has been proven to be recessive to normal, um, along with the pied-sided blood red, um, 
that is one that affects the eye. Like it, it is very interesting to me. Uh, it seems very coincidental, especially after doing all of this research. Uh, and again, I just think this is very interesting. Um, this stuff is, is my jam. So this is, uh, it was very, very fun, fun stuff to research for me. Uh, and so I, I don't think that we're ever really going to know, at least not for a long time, whether or not uh, breeding, you know, bulging eyed snakes is going to create 100% more bulging eyed snakes. Like I said, I have heard from some other breeders that have produced these snakes that Yes, if you have a snake that has these bulging eyes and you breed it to another snake that has the bulging eyes, pretty much all of the offspring have that. Uh, but again, it's just anecdotal. We haven't done actual breeding trials on it. A lot of people are very concerned about doing breeding trials on it. There is a lot of sort of moral ups and downs with it. Uh, so Don, when he hatched his eyeless line, he euthanized the entire line because he didn't want to continue to produce these snakes that didn't have eyes. Uh, and uh, But it's the opposite when you have like scaleless snakes uh, and you have a very large, I don't want to say a very large percentage of the community, but a, a relatively large percentage of the community that's highly against scaleless because scaleless, I mean, it removes the scales. And so which is worse, removing the eyes or removing the scales? And um, some people will argue that removing the scales is actually worse for a snake than removing the eyes because snakes don't really use their eyes that much. Uh, they do use them to sense like light and stuff like that. Uh, but you know, they use their tongue to tell where their food is and everything else. And so, um, they don't need their eyes as much as some might argue that they need their scales. So this, this is kind of, again, another like weird moral, um, moral thing is do we, do we continue to purposely breed, um, certain mutations over other ones. And so I guess if anybody out there is breeding palmettos that have these bug eyes, uh, first of all, I would like to know um, what your justification is, I guess. Like, do you see that it's an issue? Have you noticed that they have health issues once they become an adult? Um, and not just the palmettos. Like if you have scaleless Texas rats as well, not scaleless, uh, uh, leucistic Texas rats as well that have these bug eyes and you continue to breed them, have you noticed health issues? Do they live as long? Um, just general questions of like, how is it passed on? Is it, is it every generation you get these? Or if you breed, uh, you know, one with big eyes to one that doesn't have big eyes, maybe the babies don't have big eyes. Like I, I am genuinely curious to anyone who's breeding any type of leucistic rat snake, uh, that does have the possibility of the bug eyes. Um, what like in detail, if as much detail as you want to put in the comments, uh, like what your results have been. And for those of you who do not breed corn snakes, I would like to know, or even if you do breed corn snakes and you just have an opinion, I would love to know what your opinion is of, you know, should we continue to breed the bug-eyed corn snakes in order to find out how it's inherited so that we can prevent it in the future? Or is it one of those things that we should just either sell them as pets and make sure they're not bred or we should call them before they're even put out onto the market. Uh, I just generally would love to know your thoughts on this. And I know this has been a long video, but it was very interesting and exciting. Uh, just remember, everything that I have researched is all linked down in the description so you guys can go look at that yourselves. And also 30% off merch if you use TD30 between now and the end of the year. Thank you guys so much for watching. Comment down below if you have questions and I'll see you in the next video.